Here's why you must know the Old Testament. Here you go. Let me show you. Watch here. If you don't know the Old Testament, you're not going to make these connections. And then I'm going to go in depth on Revelation 5, 6 again. Again. Legacy Standard Bible. For behold, the stone, pay attention, stone that I put before Joshua. On one stone are what? Seven eyes. Seven eyes, right? Now let's begin. Let's focus, right? Here. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua, <clears throat> on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Alcohol, and I will remove the iniquity of that land one day. Guys, focus, class beginning. Seven eyes, all right. Why seven? <clears throat> and what are they? Zechariah 4.10. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Plumb line to measure out the temple because God had appointed Zerubbabel Joshua to rebuild the temple when the Jews returned from Babylon. That's the context. The Jews have returned from Babylon. They want to rebuild the temple. So the seven will be happy when they see the plumb line, the measuring line, in the Zerubbabel's hand preparing to rebuild the temple. What are the seven? Okay. These are the seven. These are the eyes of Yahweh which roam to and fro throughout the earth. Now, did you catch it? Do you see the seven eyes are the seven eyes of Yahweh? Meaning Yahweh's eyes by which he observes and sees all things. His eyes that roam throughout the earth. Meaning he's aware of everything that pl takes place. Okay, we got it? Notice they are the eyes of Yahweh, not a creature, Jehovah Witness, Unitarian. Eyes of Yahweh, which roam to and fro throughout the earth. And they are seven. I'll show you why seven in a minute. Something I've discussed, but creature repetition. On this one stone are seven eyes. And that <clears throat> refers to the seven eyes of Yahweh. We got it, right? You guys got it? Seven eyes on a stone. Seven eyes of Yahweh. These are Yahweh's eyes by which he's... Aware of what takes place throughout the earth. Nothing escapes his sight. Not a creature. Now John knows his Old Testament. Now look what John did. John knows his Old Testament. Then I saw in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, in the midst of the others, a lamb standing. I'm going to break down the imagery. As if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. What is John doing by ascribing to Jesus the very eyes of Yahweh? And he says, those seven eyes of Yahweh are the seven eyes of Jesus. And those seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. Let's see if you got it. John knows the Old Testament. And he took a reference to the eyes of Yahweh and he ascribed it to the Lamb. Why does Jesus the Lamb have the eyes of Yahweh? If he's a creature, he's not Yahweh. Because Zechariah 3, 9 and 4, 10 says, The seven eyes are the seven eyes of Yahweh that roam to and fro the earth. But John says, The seven eyes are the seven eyes of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, which are the seven spirits sent out into all the earth. You got it? But now, let me explain again, once again, the seven spirits and seven eyes and seven horns. Why seven? I've done it before. We'll do it again. Okay. Seven becomes the number for perfection and completion. How do we know? All right. Now, let's go through this. Here's why. Seven became known as the number of perfection. Why? Genesis 131. And God saw all that it made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. So God completed the creation in six days. Everything was complete, finished, and very good. Therefore, he stopped working on the seventh day. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and earth were complete in all their hosts. And on the seventh day, God completed his work. So seven becomes the number of completion. His work is complete. Doesn't he need to add anything? He now needs to maintain and sustain and preserve. So seven becomes a number of completion, which he had done. And he rested on Sunday from all his work, which he had done. 
Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because on it he rested from all his work which God had created and making it. So seven becomes the number of completion, complete. If something is complete, it's perfect. If it's perfect, it lacks nothing. And here, James 1, 4, if you're complete, you're perfect, lacking nothing. And let perseverance have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Are we making the connection? So why did he stop working on the seventh day? Here's why. Because God completed his work. If it's complete, it lacks nothing, therefore perfect. So seven now becomes a number for completion, perfection. We got it? You watch here, though. We're going to go a little deeper. So now, Revelation 15, 1. How many plagues does it take for God's wrath to be fully spent, poured out, Completed. Seven. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who have seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. It takes seven plagues to complete God's wrath, where God's wrath is fully spent. So again, seven, completion. His wrath is now fully poured out. We got it now? So now let's break down the implication. Seven eyes means that Jesus has perfect sight. He perfectly sees. He perfectly observes. He's fully aware. Nothing escapes his grasp. He's aware of everything everyone does on earth. No one is hidden from him. Nothing escapes his grasp because he has perfect sight and sees everything perfectly. But now notice, though, the seven eyes are the seven spirits. Because this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Why is the Spirit of God said to be seven? Not because there are seven spirits. This is unlike the seven angels. Here it's about the Spirit, not angels. Because this is referring to the Holy Spirit in His perfection. The Holy Spirit is perfect. All His works are perfect. That's why seven spirits denoting the perfection of the Holy Spirit. He's perfect. And all He does, everything He does is perfect. But I don't know if you see the connection. Notice the Lamb and Jesus are inseparable. What this means is that Jesus, in union with the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, in union with the Holy Spirit, is fully aware of all things. So this shows you not only is Christ fully aware of everything, the Holy Spirit is also fully aware and he's omnipresent because the Holy Spirit fills the earth. And the Holy Spirit filling the earth is still united to Christ in heaven. Meaning the Spirit is on earth and he's in heaven. Because the Lamb is in heaven and the seven eyes are the seven spirits that are on the face of the Lamb. So the Spirit is in heaven and earth filling heaven and earth. And because of Christ's inseparable union with the Spirit, where the Spirit is, Christ is. Where Christ is, the Spirit is. Because the Spirit comes to give us access to the Father and Son, unite us to the Father and Son, and make the Father and Son present to us. Do you see it now? You're now seeing the deity of the Son and the Spirit and what we call the inseparable operations of the Trinity. Perichoresis, the technical term. The Father works, the Son works, the Spirit works. They all work together. The Father is in the Son and the Spirit. The Son's in the Spirit and in the Father. The Spirit is in the Father and the Son. Okay, I'm going to break down seven horns. Okay, watch here. Ooh. What is a horn? And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings. A horn is a king who have not yet received the kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. So a horn is a king who has a kingdom, who has power, sovereignty, dominion. Now, if that's the case... What does it mean for Christ to have seven horns? It means he's the almighty king. He's the all-powerful king. Seven horns. Horn is a king with power, dominion, sovereignty, meaning Jesus' sovereignty is perfect. His dominion is perfect. He's almighty, all-powerful. Because he's the almighty king, no king can even dare to come up against him no king can rival him. He's a sovereign, almighty, all-powerful king. 
showing you that Jesus is omnipotent, meaning his power, his dominion is perfect. His sovereignty is perfect, lacks nothing. That means he's almighty. So here you see Jesus is almighty, all-knowing, and the spirit is all-knowing and present everywhere. We got it? That's why he's able to conquer, destroy all kingdoms, all armies, because his power is unrivaled. He's almighty, sovereign over all kings. That's why he can subjugate them. So here you have Revelation 5. The Son is not the Spirit. The Son is not God the Father. But the Son and the Spirit and the Father are the Almighty God. Do we got it now or no? Because now the Spirit appears in two different forms. Here, John sees the Spirit as seven eyes. But in the same vision, same vision, look what he sees him as. Four, five. Same vision. And out from the throne, throne of God, come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Do you see how God Almighty can assume various shapes, multiple shapes <clears throat> at the same time? He can appear in multiple forms simultaneously. So here John sees the seven spirits of seven lamps before the throne. But in the same vision, he then sees the same seven spirits as seven eyes, Revelation 5, 6, on the face of the Lamb. You got it? That answers the question. Can the Father be seen, the Son be seen, the Spirit be seen? Yes. Will we see all of them? Yes. You will. All right, but now, why is he appearing as lamps? Well, you use a lamp to lighten your path. They didn't have electricity back then. So they would light lamps to find their way in the dark. So what it means is perfect illumination, that light that you need to see and understand the way of salvation, to find yourself out of darkness, comes from the throne of God. And that perfect illumination that comes from the throne of God is the Holy Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit is the one who grants us perfect illumination because he's perfect, his enlightenment is perfect, so he gives us perfect enlightenment. That's what it means. Here's your trinity. Here is your perfect deity. The Holy Spirit is perfect. He gives you perfect illumination. He perfectly sees, and he's perfectly aware, and he's omnipresent. The Lamb is Almighty King, and he perfectly sees, and he's perfectly aware. And yet the Lamb is not the Spirit. Spirit's not the Lamb, and the Lamb and Spirit are not God the Father and the throne. There's your Trinity. Why then does he appear as a Lamb? Now let's break that down. Lamb. Notice a Lamb slain, but he's alive. Let's see. We're going to go to Isaiah. Okay, just be patient, brother. Revelation 5, 6. Why a Lamb standing as of slain? Now notice, that means the imagery is he sees a Lamb with the throat slit. A lamb with the throat slit. Okay, please pay attention. He sees a lamb with the throat slit, but it's alive. You know why? Because Christ has been resurrected, right? Jesus was slain, but he was raised immortal. So he sees the sl slit throat of the lamb, but the lamb is alive because he conquered death, and he's now raised immortal. Okay, that's the imagery. But why a lamb? Why a male lamb? Let me explain it now. Let me show you what the word for lamb is. We ready to go into this? Okay. Arnion, a lamb. Notice what it is. A little lamb. A lamb. It refers to a young male lamb. Young. It's not just the word lamb. It's young lamb. A young male lamb. Because Jesus is a male. Right? You see it? Why? Why a young male lamb? Arnion, a sheep, properly a young lamb, a little lamb, a person with pureness and virgin-like gentle intentions. You caught it or no? You know why? A little lamb, a lamb. Anyone get an idea? Let's see if you know. Remember I said John is full of references to the Old Testament? Yes, because he's the Passover lamb. Bam! 
what John is telling you is that Jesus is our Passover lamb. In other words, if you guys are listening, remember Jesus appearing as a lamb? All right. Well, the lamb, you cannot break any of its bones. Okay, watch here. It shall be eaten in a single house. You shall not bring forth any of the flesh outside the house. You shall not break any bone of it. The Passover lamb, you could not break its bone. Right? Now, what happened to Jesus when he died on the cross? John 19, 30, 37. Now, notice what John will quote in John 19, 36. This is about the Passover. Do not break any of its bone. Look what John will quote in John 19, 36. John 19, 30, 37. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Okay? So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now watch what this fulfills. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out, and he who has seen has borne witness, and his witness is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth, so he also may believe. For these things came to pass in order that Scripture would be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. You see it? Yep, Brian, you got it, buddy. It wasn't just sour wine. They gave it to him on a hyssop plant. Remember bitter herbs and hyssop? Well, here you go. You got it, sir. You got it. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had been, already been finished, in order to finish the scripture, said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop. You caught it? It's because he's the Passover lamb.